scale simulation and uh, machine learning. So first, we need to go through the artificial intelligence that the current the computer does not have. So far, the artificial intelligence it is self-learning, it assumes, and it adapts, it predicts, while our current computer can't do it. That's what we're trying to do. OK, so first, I need to introduce the neuromorphic engineering, why it comes from to use the transistors to emulate the ion channels. Kavmid from Caltech coined this term neuromorphic engineering because he found that uh, similarities, you guys can see this, the transistor and ion channels, they will have the same behavior. That's why this neuromorphic, com neuromorphic engineering comes from. OK, so there is some examples that the neuromorphic engineering has done. One at the top left, that one is the cochlear. And the uh, downside is that the silicon retina, and uh, on the left, on the right side, the, the silicon neurons that can reproduce the biological behaviors of the biological neurons. So far, most of the research has, I mean, in the previous day, most research has focusing on this sensors because we know how it works. But now we move to the brain and uh, uh, move to the cortex and the more complicated. Things. Okay, there's something has been commercialized. Uh, the mouse from Logic is designed by my supervisor Andre van Schaik, and it has been sold about uh, 15 million worldwide. And uh, the left, is, uh, in the right side, that the company is doing a uh, commercialized one cochlear model. And the, the, this one is, uh, I guess, it's DVS, which said only extract the dynamic changes of the silicon retina rather than the conventional camera. OK, neuromorphic, a neuromorphic chip has achieved uh, ten, one of the 10th breakthrough technologies for last year. I think one major reason is the IBM's TrueNOS chip, which make very good advertisement for the whole field. <laughs> now people are knowing what we are doing. Yeah, so there are some neuromorphic processors developed world around. One is the brain scales from HBP project. Some people, I think, know better than me here. And the Spinnaker, which is developed by the inventor of the ARM processor, uh, Steve Ferbers from University of Manchester. The idea is to put a bunch of ARM processors to simulate large scale neural networks. And also, the right is the IBM Chunos, which is the start of the last year. They put one million silicon neurons on one chip. Very exciting. And uh, the other one is the Quancon Zeros chip, which they're trying to put into production this year, I guess. And the HP, the synapse memory resistor stuff. OK, so this is one trend of the conventional CPU, which we can see. For the last 20 years, the transistor size of the CPU have been doubled to follow the Morse rule, and also the energy consumption goes up quickly, while the performance does not increase with the size of the transistors. So, OK, so here is some work we have done to address the large scale simulation. It's called Deep South System, which has been developed for two years. It was developed for simulating large-scale spiking neural networks. And uh, we are focusing on the scalability and the reconfigurability. And uh, to make it easy for the users, like the previous speaker talked about, to save the time of the scientists, we make a pine comfortable interface. And also, it's open source design. And it's a collection of FPGA design and the hardware uh, the analog VSI design. Here, I'm going to introduce the FPGA design. So we'll, we will make the whole design open source so people can download the Verilog file, the hardware HDL code and dump into their own FPGA and run the large scale simulation. And the, because we have the Pine Comfortable interface, it will be very easy for people to use. You don't need to have any idea about hardware design. OK, there's some comparison that uh, we use the Nest, uh, 
which uh, most people here are familiar with. So all the models in the NIST, which means you define one your model, you create 1,000, 10,000, whatever, they are all identical. And uh, the network is flat and small, and the speed is size dependent. Your grid is a simulator developed by Cobana from University of, uh, Stanford University with one million analog neurons. So in that system, because it's analog circuit, the models are heterogeneous when they're not identical. And uh, the system is hierarchy and large, and it can run in real time because it's analog system. And in our system, we can either make the neurons to be identical or they could, they could be heterogeneous. Also, in our system, it's population-based, like the system designed in uh, NIST and Brian, and it can, could be super large. In the system we have developed, it can go to up to 5 billion neurons running in real time, or uh, leak integrating from neurons. And the speed is flexible, because some people does not really want it to run in real time. You can't see anything if you're running in real time. OK, so this is the compiler, which is the user interface. So people define the neural models in the populations. You can define the connections, like what you have done in the NIST. You have the very large freedom. And then the compiler will compile the neural net list into the neural engine, which is running in the hardware. So each engine has 512k neuron cores. Each core has 256 neurons. And uh, so one neural engine can simulate up to 128 million leak integrating firing neurons, depends on the firing rate, and the 1.7 trillion synaptic connections. So each, pop each core can has up to uh, 54 uh, target cores to, co to connect. So this is the hardware structure of the FPGA platform. So the structure is pretty straightforward. We build a neural array with a bunch of neural engines and then the router will do the routing for the spikes generated by the neural engine. It reads the net list from the lookup table. And then the PCIe interface will transfer the data from the PC into the neural engine. And so one thing when we develop the system, we realize that uh, we can make the system to run in real time. However, if you need to change the design, you need to run the whole FPGA design flow that might take a day to synthesize the design. That would be totally a waste of time. So rather than doing that, we want the system to be very flexible. So all the things are stored in the lookup table. So you can easily change the network structure and the neural parameters without changing the hardware design. Just simply reroll the memory. OK, so this is the system we have. We put the several FPGA boards into one system, uh, into one PC. Oh, this is one example code, I think. The, it's pretty much like the Brian code, but it's comfortable with Pine. So you introduce the library from Deep South, and then you define the neural parameters, and then use the population to so this one is counted in 256 neurons. So this example is the, exactly the same example the previous speak just talked about. We have the excitatory neuron and connect to the inhibitory neuron. They are all readily connected. And then after doing that, you just run the simulation. That's it. You don't, know, you don't need to know any hardware knowledge. You can run it in real time. So this example contains 250. Uh, no, uh, uh, 64K neurons, 64K excitatory neuron, and 8K inhibitory neurons. Okay, so this is one result. So this is the roster plot of 1,000 neurons because we do not have the expert visualization tool like the, this morning they show. So this is just show you that we can do the real-time simulation. Well, this one only plots 1,000 neurons, but we can plot all of them if we want. OK, now we come to some real-world applications. So this is the computation problem. 
Yeah. yeah. First is use the stochastic electronics, which means um, let me show you the next one is more. We use the noise between the like our human brain. The human brain is supposed to be a noisy environment, but it can do amazing computation tasks. And here we follow the same idea. We use the noise between electronics and the build a system that can do the computation. I will address the more details in the next. So this is the ELM model, extreme learning machine model. So in the first layer is your input layer, and the middle is the hidden layer, and all the input values are randomly projected to the high dimension input uh, to the hidden layers, while the hidden layers have the nonlinear function, which will respond nonlinearly to the input. And uh, the output is the linear output neurons. We use the pseudo inverse to, random, uh, to linearly solve the weights. So maybe next one is more clear. Yeah, here is the equations. So why is our in output? And uh, this W is the randomly projected weights. And we need to solve this W, which is our decoding weights. So we use the pseudo inverse to calculate this. Yeah, then we apply to the standard benchmark, the MNIST, which I think most people here are familiar with it. The MNIST, and this one shows the size, the effect of the size of the hidden layer. We can see that the si with the increment of the size, the hidden layer size, the error goes down, but not that linear. Okay, <coughs> this is one way we use the stochastic electronics. So as you see, this in this randomly projection, in the hardware, we use the noise between analog circuits to generate. Uh, where is it? We use the difference between the analog circuits, the d device mismatch, and the process variation that will make the transistor behave differently. And then we use that to gen uh, to project the input value into the hidden layer. So this you can see we hmm? here the red one is the target function, the sync function, and the dashed one is our output function. By doing the decode using the pseudo inverse we can get the output output to match the target value. And this is the online learning. We use, because you pseudo inverse, you need uh, a lot of computation power. And we develop an online learning algorithm that can use iteration to get the result without using 100 gigabyte memory. Yeah, this is the analog implementation. I address this. It makes pages more clear. So this is TSMC 65 nanometer technology. It has more than 400 silicon neurons. And uh, this is the silicon neuron. This is the transistors used to store the decoding weight. And this is the online learning algorithm implementation. OK, so this is our digital approach, which based on the Deep South hardware. So it has 64 neurons, and uh, they use the time multiplexing approach. So you just need one physical neuron. And this is the pseudocode to tell you how to get the hidden layer response. This is the tuning curve. Yeah, this is some output result. We can see the RMEs is pretty small compared to the one that used using analog. And also, as a proof of concept, we develop a system based on this idea for the MNIST recognition. The so input layer is 784 pixels. They use the binary values. And they are all randomly projected to the hidden layer. Hidden layer has 8K neurons. And we use the pseudo inverse to decoding the output weight. And this one achieved a 3% error rate. 
And the next one, we are talking about the spatial temporal recognition. Because the previous system, they are all just vectors with very conventional artificial neural network. And next, we address more complicated stuff, the spatial temporal pattern recognition. Because in our human brain, most information are processed by the spatial temporal pattern rather than the vectors. OK. <clears throat> Yeah, we previously we used the rate code, and here we're going to use this spatial temporal pattern. So this was developed by my co-supervisor, John Tapson. So the basic idea is still three-layer neural network. But the hidden layer here, the, we, rather than using the neurons, we use the synapse. So they will have the temporal information. See, the spikes comes into from uh, into the hidden uh, into the input layer, and they will get the random weights and the projected into the hidden synapse. And this synapse uh, next page will have the alpha function or exponential decay depends on how you use it. And then this one will encode your temporal information. Again, we use the pseudo in pseudo inverse to do the decoding, then find out the weight. This one can be used for the spatial temporal pattern classification tasks. OK, there's another application we have used for the, uh, we have developed for this system. It's uh, called a, a SPAD array. This one used the uh, photon. This one was developed for the photon detection, which means when you generate a photon to the target, you get the top photon back and the, the time, the inter spike interval times, represents the distance from you and your target. So we used the scheme, which previously developed, to do the, as the backend to recognize the pattern so that we can detect the distance between our and the target. Yeah, this is more clear figure. Yeah, the, the SPED array generates a spatial temporal pattern, and uh, we use the scheme hardware and generate the spatial temporal pattern recognition, and then back to the EOM supervised learning. Uh, this is one of my colleagues developed, uh, uh, Saeed developed the scan. Uh, neural network. It is capable of doing the feature extraction without supervising. So it can do the unsupervised learning. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was just uh, wondering, to, just to make clear, yep. uh, in your spatial temporal rec pattern recognition, did you say that uh, the synaptic or, or the hidden layers in the synapse, yep. and is that a linear summation or a, a sublinear summation of uh, okay. what the inputs are, or is it still a nonlinear one? Uh, let me back to the figure. Uh, sorry. So which one you're talking about? Uh, with the spatial temporal Spatial temporal pattern. Yeah. So the output is the, you mean the input to the hidden layer? Yeah, to the hidden layer. It's random layer projection, which means you have a random weight matrix, and you do the dot product, and then it's the sum of the, all this red, random layer weighted okay. input value. Does this okay. make sense to you? Maybe I can show you. So the is this detail. something like a more of a deterministic probabilities of what would activate at that particular moment? Because you take time into account again. When the input is projected to the hidden layers, there's no temporal information. Okay. The hidden layer, the alpha function, creates this temporal information. OK. So this is like an implicit of the hidden layer, but not of the input itself. Yes. OK. I can show you more details maybe offline. Yeah, thanks. Look, other questions? Okay, th then thank you again. Mm -hmm.